Well, welcome to the June Hordes Duryman webinar, Monitoring and Managing Metabolic Diseases in the Transition Cow. We're delighted to have Dr. Daryl Nidom from Cornell University. And uh, co-hosting here is Mike Hutchins, University of Illinois, and also making everything work smoothly today is Jim Baltz and Patty Hurchin. Our webinar is sponsored by Cargill, and I am Corey Geiger, Managing Editor Hordes Duryman. And with that, let's get rolling. Yes, it's my uh, uh, pleasure to uh, formally introduce Dr. Daryl Knight. I'm here. Uh, grew up in central New York State, uh, involved with his grandparents' dairy farm. And didn't realize this, Daryl, that your dad was also a dairy veterinarian for about 40 years. Uh, Daryl then graduated uh, from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Cornell University, receiving his DVM and a PhD there as well. And currently is employed in the Department of Population Medicine and, Diagnost and Diagnostic Science at Cornell University. He also, besides his responsibility there, he is the director of the Summer Dairy Institute and director of Quality Milk uh, Production Services over there as well. So uh, numerous awards and recognitions. So Daryl, we will turn the program over to you and let you discuss your topic for today. My, as Corey points out, monitoring and managing metabolic diseases in transition cows. Uh, welcome aboard. Well, thanks very much. Uh, let's hold on to our hats because we're going to get going. All right. So subtitle here, the Catabolic Armageddon. And uh, my friend and colleague, Bill Wavern, takes credit for that. Um, what the uh, modern dairy cow goes through in transition right now is a high rate of catabolism, and it can turn into an Armageddon, but I'm also pretty confident we can manage through that pretty well. Quickly, I got to note, I work here at Cornell and have great collaborations with people around uh, the world, like Gary Etzel at Madison, and we're not the first ones to think about transition cows. People like Tom Hurt, Jim Drakeley, and Duffield taught me lots of stuff before I was uh, knee high, okay? But uh, my hat really goes off to all the dairymen that are right here near Cornell. We've got about 100,000 lactating dairy cows uh, in about an hour drive from my office. And we work pretty consistently with those producers, and they uh, really expect us to ask some real-world questions and provide them some real-world solutions. So that hopefully drives our research programs. And any of you who've been through graduate school know that you're the real stars of any shows here. This is uh, a group of past and recent uh, PhD students. Most of them have gone on to faculty positions by now. And we're going to be going through a bunch of their work over the past five or seven years to hopefully put together a little story about energy balance and transition cows. So the transition cow facing many, many challenges. And if we work here up from the bottom, we're getting better at relieving some of those social pressures, which, uh, as you'll see in a couple weeks, there's going to be another webinar looking at dry matter intake by uh, our own Mike Hutchins. We're getting better at managing those social pressures so we don't hamper that dry matter intake. But we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about that today. One thing that we're keenly interested in, protein balance. This is a harder nut to crack, but we're pretty interested in that too. It's pretty in vogue to understand mineral imbalances again right now. When I was a baby vet, there was a lot of interest in subclinical hypocalcemia. Then it kind of went away, and it's, it's, uh, it's back topical again. But what we're going to focus for the next 45 minutes on before we get into some question and answers, it's going to be negative energy balance. And my research group right now, we're pretty interested in sort of breaking open the shell, this relationship between metabolic disease and immune dysregulation as related to energy balance. We won't have a lot of time to get into that today, but we'll hint at a couple things. But hopefully we look at the big 20,000 foot management factors for that. <clears throat> so I'm sure everyone on this here webinar can see what's happening, right? We have the process of calving. However, what you can't see is the rapid, rapid change in energy requirements from two days before to two days after this girl's energy requirements are going to double. So here's some arithmetic that Jim Drakely put together. Two days before to two days after. Let's take this approximately 1,500 pound cow. Before she's calving, she's putting about 11 mcals into maintenance. 
and that doesn't change much after calving. There's about 3M cows for pregnancy that goes away after calving, but 3M cows is not a lot. If she's a mature cow, she's not putting any energy into growth, but look at this, 18, 19 M cows for milk production, just a couple days after calving. So going from about 14 to over 28 in the matter of four days, that's about like you and I sitting on a couch and then jumping up and deciding to run a marathon, okay, without training, right? Doubling our energetic requirements. So these modern cows, they are indeed metabolic athletes, right? So here's a bar graph, kind of like that arithmetic that Jim Drake put together. And this is a stretching out a little bit more week prepartum to week postpartum. And we're up near 40 M cows, net energy lactation, coming from about 15. So we're over here, we're hitting about that metabolic equivalent of a marathon every day for this dairy cow. And we can manage this dry matter intake to some extent, but if we closely look at what happens to cows' intakes right around calving, they all drop off. Sometimes it's hard to see this when we're looking at group effects, when we're just measuring pen level intakes, but pretty much individually they all go down. So how does this cow get the energy to meet those metabolic demands when she's going from about 14 M cows to something over 30 in the matter of days and she can't do it through dry matter intake, almost no matter what we do. Well, it comes down to mobilizing body reserves. Some of that will be muscle tissue or, or you know, skeletal muscle, but most of it comes from mobilizing body fat. And that can be either subcutaneous fat or visceral fat and in concert with signals from insulin and epinephrine, that fat is mobilized as non-esterified fatty acids. So those non-esterified fatty acids, or NEFA, okay, we're gonna talk a lot about NEFA for the next approximately 40 minutes, okay? That gets mobilized, it goes into the blood, and some of it goes directly to the mammary gland where it's turned into milk fat. That's sometimes why we see when some cows are really melting, when they're really milking the fat off their back, in that first week in lactation, we'll see milk fats somewhere north of 6 or 7%, okay? That's from that non-esterified fatty acid being mobilized and going straight to the mammary gland. A bunch of the rest of it goes into the liver. And this is a normal process because the liver, the mitochondria, and peroxisomes, they're going to use that NEFA for energy right? And they're going to metabolize it into carbon dioxide and propionate eventually. And that's great when we get a lot of propionate out. However, when we overwhelm the liver's ability and particularly those organelles ability to metabolize that NEFA, we turn on ketogenesis. A little bit of ketogenesis in early lactation cows is absolutely normal. However, when we turn on too much ketogenesis, that's when we run into ketosis and related problems. And then the rest of it gets laid down as triglycerides or fat in the liver. And unfortunately, ruminants, particularly dairy cows, are particularly bad at packaging up that triglyceride and moving it out of the liver in concert with this very low density lipoproteins. So if any of you are out there feeding choline, particularly, particularly in a rumen protected form, that's one of the things that choline is helping do is package up these triglycerides and getting it out of the liver so we don't have all those problems with fatty liver. <clears throat> and here's another neat thing, right? We just looked at that, those ketone bodies, that ketogenesis that turns on when the cow's ability to metabolize all that NEFA. So here's a pretty elegant experiment that Rupert Bruckmeyer's group did in Switzerland. And the punchline of this is, quoting, after they induced hyperketonemia in early lactation cows, it says, indicates that the frequently observed immunosuppression during spontaneous ketonemia in early lactation and hence increased susceptibility to mastitis is most likely directly caused by the elevated concentration in BHBA, beta-hydroxybutyric acid, one of those ketone bodies. That's probably a bit of an overstatement, but in the big picture, 
it is part of the reason why there's immune dysregulation in some of these early lactation cows. So here are those three ketone bodies I mentioned. Acetone, the one that's metabolized in the lungs and breathed out so we can smell it. Acetoacetic acid, another of those ketone bodies. And this one is often uh, comes out in urine. And if we're using keto sticks to turn purple to monitor for ketosis, this is the ketone body we're looking for there. And then there's this one, beta-hydroxybutyric acid, the one that's most stable in blood and probably the one we're going to talk about for most of the next hour here. And when we see the clinical manifestation of ketosis, you all know there's decrease in appetite, weight loss, and decrease in milk production. We're going to tune in to subclinical ketosis for the rest of this time, though. So what have we learned here in the first uh, about eight minutes? Transition cows have a huge challenge, a number of things, including visiting this state of negative energy balance. And what we want to do is make that visit as short as possible because all cows go into it. It's normal homeuretic response to early lactation for mammals. However, we want to keep that visit short and the depth of it pretty small. We can look at this extent of negative energy balance with measuring non-esterified fatty acids or ketone bodies, particularly BHPA. And infectious diseases, including mastitis and metritis, occur around calving. So those really smart graduate students I mentioned, they come up with really good questions in concert with our local dairy producers, and they ask these questions. What are the impacts of this negative energy balance and subclinical ketosis in modern dairy cows? How do we know when a cow or a herd is at risk for poor performance, and how much of it is out there? So a few years ago, we set out to answer this question, and we wrote up a couple papers. And if you want to send me an email, I can uh, send you these papers for uh, educational purposes. And what we're going to do is hit the cliff notes of a whole bunch of JDS peer-reviewed papers here in the next 40 minutes. So in what we'll refer to as the 100 cow study, me and the graduate students and the technicians, we went out and visited about 100 herds here in the Northeast. And we went on one visit and all of the herds were milking more than 250 cows, and it turns out on average about 1,000. They were all freestall housed, feeding a TMR, and they all kept really good records, most of them in dairy comp. And when we went out to sample these transition cows, we only sampled from apparently healthy cows. So no cows in hospital pens, no cows treated for anything, no cows with leg bands on, no cows that were on the DNV list for any reason. And then we sampled cows that were 14 to two days before calving. And in this study, a separate group that was three to 14 days postpartum. And we took at least 15 cows per herd. And as I mentioned, we ended up going to about 100 herds from which we sampled about 2,800 animals, about a third heifers and two thirds cows. And among all of those cows, this is what we saw. And it turns out, these herds were a little better than average, but not the 100 best herds we could find, nor the 100 worst herds, right? They had about 3.5% DAs, pretty typical, about 7% clinical ketosis, maybe a little high. Retained placentas or metritis, about 12%. Their median mature equivalent 305 milk production, about 27,000 pounds, and they're hitting about a 20% 21-day preg rate. So pretty good herds, a little better than average, pretty representative of what we think of a modern 1,000 cow or more TMR fed freestall. Then we did a whole bunch of fancy statistics on those cows, looking at the concentrations of NEFAs and concentrations of BHBAs, those ketone bodies, and we looked at downstream outcomes and looked for the relationship between the concentration of NEFA, and for example, here, displaced abomasum. And for example, doing this ROC curve analysis, we found that when compared to a cow that has lower than 0.7 milliequivalents per liter non esterified fatty acids, comparing her to a cow that has higher than that, it's a highly accurate test for being associated or predicting a displaced abomasum. So we went through that exercise with prepartum NEFA, 
postpartum NEFA and postpartum BHB. And we found that cows with higher than 10 milligrams per deciliter BHB compared to lower ones, they were at seven times higher risk of getting a DA, five times higher risk of getting clinical ketosis, and about twice as likely to go on to get clinical metritis. This means 700% more likely to go on to get a DA. So we did that exercise, as I mentioned, for all of NEFA, prepartum and postpartum, and BHB. And elevated concentrations of those two energy-related metabolites related to risk of disease, reproduction, and milk. We'll take the example down here of beta-hydroxybutyric acid. Like we mentioned, compared to a cow that has high BHB, over 10 milligrams per deciliter, compared to one that has less than that, her risk of going on to get any of those postpartum metabolic diseases is about four and a half times higher. She's 14 to 18% less likely to be pregnant by 120 days compared to a girl that has less than 10 milligrams per deciliter. And the cows went on to make 700 pounds less milk per lactation. Same sort of punchline for pre and postpartum nephas as well. So moving on from those relationships at the individual cow level, okay, we want to know how much of this is out there. If it's only a couple percent of cows with these relationships, well, we probably ought to study something different. But it turns out among those about 1,500 prepartum animals, right, we saw that about a quarter of the cows and about 45% of the heifers had high prepartum nephas, and about a quarter to almost a third of the heifers or cows had either high postpartum NEFA or postpartum BHBs. So this high energy metabolite concentrations affects lots of cows and heifers out there. So we figured it was probably worth studying some more. The next question we really wanted to get into was, okay, what's the herd level opportunity? So yeah, we already know that there's a strong association between having high metabolites and cow level things, but a lot of the things we want to do in the herd, either at the preventive or corrective level, are at the herd level. And in his 2004 Vet Clinics of North America, Gary Etzel said, well, these herd levels have not been well defined. So I had some talented graduate students and a lot of good herds, so we set out to answer this question. The question is, what proportion of sampled animals with elevated metabolite levels is going to lead to herd level effects on health, reproduction, and production, not just cow level effects? And if you want all the gory details on this one, I also encourage you to get from me or someone else this JDS publication as well. But the highlights of that are, if you go out and take a sample of cows, for example, sampling 15 cows at risk, okay, that would be say three to 14 days postpartum, and 15% of that sample, which is only two, probably three animals above that, comparing to a herd that has less than 15%, that herd's pregnancy rate is off by almost a point. The risk of any metabolic disease is 1.2% higher, and the heifers and cows are making about 1,000 or about 700 pounds less milk, okay, across the herd. And the same sort of punchline for prepartum nephas and postpartum nephas. So to quickly reiterate again, we now see that there's herd level effects also when a high percentage or proportion of a sample of at-risk prepartum or postpartum cows are above those individual cow cut points. And how many herds had 15% or more of their animals above these? Turns out 65% of the herds, of those 100 herds, had more than 15% of their animals with above this 0.7 milliequivalents per liter NEFA cut point. But 35% of them, okay, were lower, which means it is an achievable goal to get down here. And these herds were really, really shiny. 
we can also see a dose response effect here, right? As we go from 15% of the animals to 20% of the animals to 25% to 30% of that sample with elevated individual animals above this cut point, we see the increasing change in disease incidence from about 1.5% up to about 6.5% for those herds that had 30% of their animals above this 0.7 NEFA cut point. Again, there were 42% of the herds with more than 15% of the animals above the postpartum BHB cut point. However, an achievable goal this 15% is because almost 60% of the herds were below. So here we have a polling question, and I encourage you to write in your answers. How do you use BHB monitoring in your herd, if you do it all? You use it to evaluate transition cow management, monitor changes with forage and ration shifts, compare it to your neighbors, for in fact, or you just don't monitor BHB. Well, Daryl, we're off and running here. Let's see what's going to happen now. we got to vote early now. Let's get going here. We're off and running here. And, uh, uh, Corey, are you going to vote on this one? Well, uh, voting, we of course, Mike, is for attendees. So uh, we look to our guests that are attendees. Verbal, verbal, I, verbal. I'm going to make you. Verbal voting. I do, I do think that, uh, you know, obviously the heart of this matter is uh, transition cows. And uh, that. That's where we're looking at it at the words very much. Yeah, I'm going to vote there too. Let's close the uh, polls here, Jim and uh, Daryl. Uh, why don't you give us uh, your uh, your 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 thoughts on the voting here? Well, first thing I'm going to tune right into, and I planted this question a little bit. Zero percent said to compare to my neighbors' herds, and benchmarking between herds is actually one of my pet peeves. If you are going to use any kind of monitoring, particularly BHBA monitoring, that's most well-placed when you do it longitudinally or through time within your own herd. And 60% of you said, evaluate transition cow management. And I do think it's a pretty good monitor to get that whole ball of wax all at once. So uh, we'll see by the end, maybe the 30% of you might be convinced that uh, perhaps some uh, BHBA monitoring might be the right thing for you guys to do in your herds. So some next questions. When do these high metabolites happen? What are the dynamics of the subclinical ketosis in high producing herds? And does the timing matter? So we're going to move here from that 100 herd study into a study where we looked at four herds intensively. And we did this in collaboration, a uh, grad student and I, out here in New York with our colleague, Dr. Ed Salon in Wisconsin. So. We got two pretty good herds here in New York and uh, uh, two excellent herds here in Wisconsin, all milking, you know, a few thousand cows. And we dug into these herds really intensely. We tested all the cows in those herds for between May and August, six times between three and 16 days in milk. So the students and the technicians were out there every single Monday, Wednesday, and Friday sampling BHBA in blood from these cows. And we define subclinical ketosis as anything between 1.2 and 2.9 millimoles per liter. And I'll pause right here because some people report BHBs as milligrams per deciliter and some people report it as millimoles per liter. And it's pretty easy cowboy math. We can just move this decimal point one place and we're back to milligrams per deciliter. So this 1.2 is equivalent to that 10 or 12 milligrams per deciliter I was just talking about 10 minutes ago. This is the tool we use to measure this. Very accurate and timely meter. Unfortunately, not on the market very easily in the United States anymore. But you still can get them if you want. We did a bunch of fancy statistical analysis. And this is in here in the archives for reference. Okay. We ended up sampling over 2,000 cows from these herds, of which we had 1,700 left in the final analysis, of which 976 never had one bout of hyperketonemia or ketosis, and 741 of them did, right? And you can see a varying herd level incidence ranging from 
26% in the lowest New York herd, up to 56% in the highest Wisconsin herd. And here's where it happened in days in milk, okay? Most of these cases of hyperketonemia or subclinical ketosis happened at three, four, five days in milk. And then there weren't many new cases after a week in milk. Pretty interesting to me. This is not what I expected. And if we didn't do anything to those cows, they went back under 1.2 millimoles per liter BHB in about five days. You just left them alone. However, we're going to see that the damage was already done. And here's a graph of prevalence, which is slightly different than incidence. Incidence is the new cases. Prevalence is all the existing cases. So you can see this is a little flatter if we realize that the average case takes about five days to resolve. And here I just define incidence and prevalence for you for reference in the future. It turns out, however, that the incidence is about two times the measured prevalence. So if you went into a herd today and found the prevalence was 20%, it probably means that 40% of the cows are going to have at least one incident case of subclinical ketosis. And these four herds mimicked those 100 herds. If you were never ketotic, only 0.3% of them had a DA. However, 6.5% of the subclinical ketotic cows went on to get a DA. Early removal was influenced by ketosis, conception was influenced by ketosis, as was milk yield. And then Dr. McCart asked what I thought was a pretty interesting question. Doesn't matter when this happens. So we compared the first subclinical ketosis positive event between three and seven days in milk to those after eight to 16 days. And what did we find? Those cows that had an early case of clinical ketosis, of subclinical ketosis, were six times more likely to get a DA, four and a half times more likely to be removed before 30 days in milk, 30% less likely to be pregnant to first service, and made about four and a half to five pounds less milk per cow per day than those cows that had their first positive after a week in milk. This is not a picture of my father, but as Dr. Hutchin mentioned, my dad, 40-year dairy practitioner, this is not what he taught me about ketosis when I was uh, a young kid riding around with him treating clinical ketosis with a bottle of sugar, right? That was something that happened at two to three weeks in milk and responded pretty well to that bottle of sugar. Now we're seeing a transition cow disease, which probably starts back in the previous lactation. Certainly what we do to the cows in the dry period matters and what we do to those very early lactation cows really matters. So this is not my father's ketosis. We also saw that the concentration of BHBA at onset matters as well. And you can see here, as the concentration at first BHBA test goes up, predicted milk per day goes down. So what did we learn from this very intensive four herd study in New York and Wisconsin? Subclinical ketosis happens in early lactation. And cows that get it earlier in lactation are at much higher risk for adverse events than those later. And the risk increases as the BHBA concentration at first test increases. So we now know that it affects lots of cows and the outcomes are pretty bad when it happens. So to figure out how much resources on a dairy can we allocate to controlling this, preventing it, or in fact even treating it, we wanted to come up with an estimate. So some definitions here. Ketosis, we'll call that two things. Clinical ketosis, perhaps above three millimoles per liter. Subclinical ketosis, between 1.2 and 2.9. And hyperketonemia, anything above 1.2, okay? And we wanted to build a model to estimate the cost of hyperketonemia. And we want to break that down into the component costs and the total costs. The component costs are related to hyperketonemia without considering the other associated diseases. And those other associated diseases for which we have good data are displaced abomasums and metritis. Okay, so here are the component costs. That's broken down into direct costs and indirect costs. The direct costs, things we might use for diagnostics like measuring BHB, 
therapeutics, treating with whatever we treat with, discarded milk, vet service, labor, death loss. And in the indirect costs are the future milk production losses, future culling losses, and repro losses. And as we can quickly see here in this pie graph, it's those almost hidden costs of repro, death, and future milk that are hard to see that account for most of it. The diagnostics, therapy, and labor, very little of the component cost of hyperketonemia. So if we put that together with the attributable costs to DA and metritis, okay, because we're figuring out that DAs, about 88% of them are attributable to hyperketonemia and 70% of metritis, we'll look right down here, the bottom right corner, almost $300 per case of hyperketonemia. And if this is something that's happening to, on average, 40% of cows, it turns out to be a pretty big deal, something that we can turn our attention to and allocate resources to, to either prevent, hopefully, or if we have to, treat. So here are the obvious questions now. What do we do with these cows with subclinical ketosis? What do we do with herds that have a lot of subclinical ketosis? Well, first thing, we got a diagnosis. And I'm sure just about everybody on this webinar has got uh, lots of cow urine on their hands using these keto sticks. They're pretty good in that they only cost about 20 cents each, and you get an answer in about 10 seconds. However, you have to stimulate the cow to urinate. And at least in my rough hands, only about 40 to 60% are going to urinate. So we need a plan for cows that won't do it on demand. So one thing that my kids kind of like, they like these powders because if you put the pee on them, they turn into stuff, stuff like Silly Putty, and it's kind of fun to play with. However, they're only about 35% sensitive. And for something that costs almost $300 per case, I don't want to miss about 65% of those cases. So here's a test that uh, you can buy, marketed by Alanco at about $2 a test, and increased sensitivity, somewhere here in the middle 80s, and the specificity, the true negative rate, also in the middle 80s, okay? This is a pretty good test used in milk. The urine test that we all know and love, only about 75% sensitive, so we're probably gonna miss about 25% of those cases. So let's suggest, if we really wanna be serious about this, measuring blood, and when this Diabetic meter, the precision extra, started getting uptake in the industry. A lot of people were using it. Unfortunately, it's hard for us to get here in the United States now. So our colleagues here at Cornell, PhD student Catherine Bach, in collaboration with Wolfgang Heubitzer from Germany, under the guidance of Dr. McCart, looked at comparing this precision extra meter to a new one coming out of Germany, soon to be on the market, this TIDOC, and the Nova Max and the Nova Vet. And you can see the precision extra, very sensitive when compared to the gold standard clinical pathology values of 1.2 millimoles per liter. The Nova Max, which is really built for humans, not very sensitive, and not in fact more sensitive than using the keto sticks. The Nova Vet, which is actually built for cows, again, quite sensitive with a nice high specificity. So, we're going to make a recommendation. Either of these two meters are very acceptable, okay, and they're about $2 a strip. You might be able to get them a little bit cheaper, okay. However, the Nova Max, particularly since we have this Nova Vet available to us, we can use that. And there's two more meters coming on the market, and you should be on the lookout for good validation data associated with them. Okay, here are the BHBA Portacheck. Okay, they're going to come in at about $2.50 a strip. And the Centrovet check, perhaps at about, at about a dollar yet, but I don't know of any peer reviewed data on those yet. So, now that we know how to diagnose cows and herds, perhaps we're going to have to treat some cows with ketosis. So, those of you on the webinar listening, how do you treat ketosis in your herds? A shot of dexamethasone, maybe you don't ever have ketosis to treat. A bottle of 50% dextrose IV like my dad taught me. 
300 cc's of oral propylene glycol once a day for three to five days, or perhaps some combination of the above. Wow, here we go. I'm, I'm, I know where I'm going to vote. Uh, Corey, are you ready to vote here orally or not? Uh, the polls are open and well, we're running. Mike, I sure like to vote for the second one, but we know that's not uh, <laughs> not reality. <laughs> not even at the horse dairyman farm, Corey? Can't say so. Nope. Oh, gee. <laughs> Well, Guernsey's probably don't get, never mind, I won't go there. And interesting, we're going to close this off here very quickly here. Uh, I, I see, and you didn't give me a choice of, say, 600 uh, cc's. Do you want to maybe comment on that, the, the level? Anyway, let's close this off, Daryl, and uh, we've got a lot of people voting here. We're in good shape here, almost 60%. What do you think? I, uh, I see it's uh, interesting, only 2% of the people using dexamethasone because my sense would be that uh, more people are using that uh, as a historical treatment than the 2%, but there's a lot of good reasons to probably not do that. And some recent peer-reviewed publication from our colleagues at University of Guelph would suggest we probably shouldn't be. So that's good. We're at 2% there. Um, nobody listening to this webinar uh, doesn't have ketosis, so I think we're all honest. Okay, that was just an honesty check. Must be a young crowd, a young crowd if only 16% are using uh, a bottle of IV dextrose, okay? Or perhaps maybe some of that 35% the combination is in there. We're going to dig deep into looking at propylene glycol their next slides. So we'll see where we go there. And in the Q&A session, I'm sure that usually comes up, you know, what combination of things do we use to treat ketosis? So how do we treat it, right? There's a lot of talk now using a half a bottle of this 50% dextrose, or maybe it's a whole bottle. I'm going to suggest for clinically ketotic cows, I'm still going to want to give the liver a break by giving some IV dextrose. Corticosteroids, no one voted for it, and that's going to be my vote right now. Also, probably don't need to, except for in those odd cases of nervous ketosis, perhaps that's helpful. B12. Our uh, colleague, Mike Overton, uh, wrote a nice paper looking at this. However, it's unfortunate we can't get that so much on the market, but theoretically some, some B vitamins might be good for these cows as well. So how about this unfun activity of oral propylene glycol? I don't know about you guys, but it's not my idea of fun, but it turns out we're going to look at the data. It's a pretty good thing to do. All right. So here's a couple publications if you want the gory details, and we'll hit the cliff notes right now. So we did a randomized trial to look at the effect of oral propylene glycol administration in cows diagnosed with subclinical ketosis and early lactation. And we looked at a whole bunch of what I think are important outcomes. So why do this oral propylene glycol? Different than if we feed glycol or some other derivative, we get two modes of action here. If we feed it, either orally or mix it in the feed, we're going to get an increased supply of propionate. However, if we bolus this, we also get an insulin surge, which decreases the glucose demand by peripheral tissues and lets the cow catch up metabolically a little bit. And that's part of the reason why the oral dosing is helpful. So in this study, we found cows diagnosed as subclinically ketotic, and then we randomized them to treatment, either getting 300 cc's of oral propylene glycol or getting nothing. And what did we observe? We observed those cows that were treated, okay, with glycol. Here are the blue line, okay, were 1.5 times more likely, or you can read these Kaplan-Meier graphs as 1.5 times quicker to resolve their subclinical ketosis than the control cows. We also noted a milk production response. To look at this accurately, we had to use those three out of four herds that had daily milk weights. The two New York herds, they saw a three to three and a half pound milk bump from giving those cows glycol. However, the one Wisconsin herd only had a 0.2 pound bump and that was not statistically different. But overall, we're getting about a pound of milk. How does oral glycol affect subsequent DA incidence? Across all four herds, on average, we're 60% okay, 
more likely to develop a DA if you did not get the propylene glycol when you needed it, when you had it. And we saw that response pretty similarly across all four herds. How about removal by 30 days in milk? If you were subclinic and got glycol, we decreased your risk of being removed, okay, by almost half, or the cows that um, were 2.1 times more likely to be removed, okay, if you didn't get it. So a pretty profound effect there as well. So here's Emily, one of the students who was working on it. She got pretty good at dosing these cows with 300 cc's for, on average, five days, and we found out it really does help. Speeds of resolution of ketosis, prevents progression to severe ketosis. I didn't show you that data for brevity. It increases early lactation milk yield, at least in some herds, and remarkably reduces the risk of displaced abomasum and premature culling. So the next questions the farmers always have, well, what's the cost benefit of doing all this testing and all this glycol treatment? And then moreover, how do we prevent this severe negative energy balance. So we put together a model economically analyzing testing and treatment. So we tested a bunch of different strategies. No testing at all, just simply give all fresh cows five days of oral propylene glycol or test three times per week. For example, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like we did in that experiment. Test two times per week. Let's say Tuesday and Friday, test one time per week, just Wednesdays. And when you find the positive cows, treat them with oral propylene glycol, okay, for five days with 300 cc's. So here's some assumptions we made in the model, and we modeled it per 100 fresh cows, five days of treatments, okay. We got feed price in here, milk price at the rosy old 13 cents per pound, okay? Cost of diagnostics, cost of diseases, and we started with a subclinical incidence of 40%. And what you can see from this fancy stochastic Monte Carlo simulation we did, which means we ran this 10,000 times to simulate either 10,000 fresh cows or 10,000 different herds, is that testing two times per week at a if you have a 40% incidence, is the best strategy to do. And it's you're gonna realize about, on average, $1,000 profit per 100 fresh cows. But what this model is really sensitive to is your underlying subclinical ketosis. When we get out here, okay, above 50% or so, the red line is on top. And that's just treat them all. Hopefully by now, we can all agree that having 50 or 60% of your cows with subclinical ketosis is certainly not a goal. And we don't want to put propylene glycol on that fire, right? What we want to do is work to get it back down here. When we're under 15 or so percent, none of these strategies are above zero. So that's our goal. We want to get down here where we don't have to treat any cows. And if we're in between say 15 to 20% and 45 to 50%, again, that test twice a week and treat the positive ones and not treat the negative ones turns out to be the most economically beneficial. So if you want to read the details of this, it's in a vet clinic of North America uh, titled here. And again, I can send you this full publication for educational purposes if you like. And in there, you'll find a chart where you sort out the incidence and the prevalence and we talked about that already. And here it is. First day, go in and estimate your herd level prevalence. Sample approximately 20 cows, maybe 15, that are between three and 14 days in milk. The positive cows are gonna be those ones that are over 1.2 millimoles per liter. And we have three groupings, less than 15%, 15 to 40%, and above 40%. And if you're less, then 15%, we're gonna suggest light monitoring. Perhaps monitor that prevalence monthly. And if you stay under 15%, you're probably doing a fine job and you should 
focus your management efforts somewhere other than those things associated with negative energy balance. You're really doing a great job. If you're in this typical range of 15 to 40 percent, we're going to suggest monitoring those cows that are fresh between three and nine days twice a week, treating the positive ones, not treating the negative ones, and again, while you're working on preventive measures. And if you're above 40 percent, it's probably cost effective in the short term, let me say that again, in the short term, to just simply give every cow glycol, okay, for about five days while you're working to get that prevalence and incidence down. Hopefully, we're going to start, we'll probably make a stop here at 25%, and then we're going to work to get it down to 15%. So, we're up to another polling question. How do you, listeners, prevent ketosis in your herds? Do you use steam up dry cow rations? Do you feed rumensin and or rumen protected choline? Do you use a controlled energy dry cow ration? Or do you already give propylene glycol to every single cow for three to five days after freshening? Or you simply just don't believe in ketosis or doing anything about it? Wow, some of those are, now this is going to be a slower one. I think we're going to not be quite as quick voting here, but we're polls are open for thirty seconds already, and we're off and running here. Corey, you know, I know which one I'm going to. Which one are you going to pick, Corey? I'm, I um, I I find this interesting. Well, there's a lot of options there and, and variation at this point, and uh, so we'll we'll see what the attendees have to say here. And I agree with you. So this one's a little harder to sort. Through. Well, I tell you, being from Illinois, that control energy ration by Dr. Drakeley, I just got to be homered as far as that goes. So we'll we'll range orange and blue. Okay, let's turn to close the poll, Jim and and uh, Daryl. Any big surprises here? No, and as as you got as Corey and uh, Dr. Hutchins both alluded to, there's a lot of overlapping answers here. And perhaps since this is uh, a Midwest centered webinar, and maybe there's a lot of people around Jim Drakeley's homeland, I'm not surprised that the uh, controlled energy dry cow rations are at 64 percent. And uh, maybe even Dr. Drakeley's listening in, and you all felt uh, you had to answer that one. So uh, we'll look ahead at some of the experiments we've done to support some of this as we go ahead here. And then we'll take some Q&A on that at the end. So here's some generic important stuff to not forget when preventing transition cow catabolic Armageddon, right? Access to feed, right? We're going to suggest probably 30 inches of linear feed space or only 80% of headlocks be filled in those transition cows. Few group changes, right? The Wisconsin group studies that. We don't want to have a lot of social turmoil. We want to separate, if we can, parity one from those older cows. I'm going to move quickly through this energy density stuff, but this is sort of the specs for that controlled energy dry cow rations. And we'll look through a little experiment here. One of those polling questions was, do you feed remensin? Um, without being an uh, infomercial for anything here, rumensin seems to be pretty cost effective for a number of things in dairy herds. Rumen protected choline, we talked through the physiology of that a little bit earlier. One of the things that that does is helps shuttle those triglycerides out of the liver so we don't have the sequelae of uh, fatty liver. Heat abatement, even here in the uh, upper Midwest and where I am sitting in the Northeast, we also have to pay attention to heat abatement. And then if any of you have other products that affect NEFA metabolism or liver physiology, if you want to get together with me on that and we'll get a patent together for something, uh, let me know. Okay. So again, I, I have to always put credit where credit is due. We're not the first ones to think about how to feed close up dry cows or in fact far up dry cows, and it's been mentioned, uh, Jim Drakeley's been doing a lot of this, but way back in Hort, in the year 2000, Pete Draymond wrote this article about rethinking the dry cow rations, okay? He and Gordy Jones have been working on this for quite a while. And there's a lot of questions about restricting the energy in the dry period, not below the requirements, but not way overfeeding them either. And then there's been many experiments looking at various dietary strategies in the dry period. 
increasing the energy content, restricting the energy content by limit feeding, or increasing the fiber, the step-up systems, the restricted energy far off, and then high energy close-up. All kinds of combinations and permutations. So we set out to do an experiment because we decided that we don't want to do anything in a restricted feeding sense. So we want to put together an experiment where we could discern which dietary strategy in the dry period and ad lib system leads to the smallest degree of negative energy balance while maintaining milk production levels in dairy cows. And if I hear anything from the field why people don't like these controlled energy diets is because they have a notion that peak milk might not be as high or early milk production might not be as high. So we really wanted to look at that. And this is all detailed in this publication here in JDS, came out in, uh, about a year and a half ago. So here are our experimental groups. We had one group with a controlled energy diet, and I don't really want to call it low because it's not lower than what they needed. We just controlled it. We had a step-up group where we controlled it far off and had an intermediate energy in the close-up period, and then we had a high-energy diet all the way from dry-off through parturition. And this is what it looked like in front of the cows. And you can see pretty much what we did is we simply swapped out wheat straw for corn silage as you move from that controlled energy diet to the high energy diet. And this is what they really ate. And as suspected, right, that diet with a lot of candy in it, they ate a whole lot of it. You know, they actually consumed about 36 pounds of that high energy candy like diet. So here's what we really ended up feeding. We did what we set out to do in terms of the energy balance. In that controlled energy group, we were about 112% on average in the close-ups. Intermediate was 126%, and the high diet, 150%, according to the Cornell Net Carbohydrate and Protein System model. We tried to keep the metabolizable protein equal across the groups, so that wasn't confounding our experiment, and we settled in pretty well, I think, at about 120 or so percent of metabolizable protein. And we achieved that protein and energy levels by backing down the NDF from 48 to 42 to 41 percent, and moving up the starches from 15 percent to 20 percent to about 24 <clears> percent. <throat> so here's our sampling scheme. So let's look at this dry matter intake. You can see that there's some differences prepartum, and like we noted, right, they love that high energy diet prepartum. However, when they were all fed the same postpartum lactating cow ration, no real difference in postpartum dry matter intake between the groups, okay? P-value 0.75, no real difference there. How about postpartum BHB concentration. So if we can remember back to about a half an hour ago, if cows are above 1.2, turns out to be pretty bad for them. From 7 to 10 days in milk, those cows in the high energy group, the average cow was hyperketonemic in that group. Probably not a good thing. Same sort of picture in the postpartum NEFAs. That high energy group, quite a bit higher. How about this milk production? If we do it unenergy corrected, those three lines out to six weeks in milk or about 40 days in milk, they're right on top of each other. And heck, numerically, the controlled energy might even be a little bit higher, but no statistical difference. No statistical difference even in energy corrected milk, even if we're probably getting a little bit of extra milk fat from that high energy diet. And this is in there for those modeling wonks who want to compare the CNCPS to the NRC, okay? Energy balance, not much difference between the groups, but the controlled energy, a little bit better, those two models being offset from each other. So how about cases or bouts of clinical ketosis? There were none in the controlled energy diet, four and five respectively, in that intermediate and high energy group. And how about bouts or episodes of subclinical ketosis or hyperketonemia, only 13 in that controlled energy group, and then up to 32 and 31 in that intermediate and high group. So in summary, from this feeding experiment about how are we going to prevent negative energy balance without losing milk production, 
right? We didn't see any difference in dry matter intake postpartum between those groups. Negative energy balance, less severe in those controlled energy group fed cows. No differences in early lactation milk yield with a slight trend for higher milk fat. And notably, right, the concentrations of BHPA and NEFA higher in that higher energy group. So we're getting close to the question and answer time here. I've got to acknowledge a lot of people who helped us out with this stuff. Uh, we've been lucky enough to get funding from the USDA to support uh, the American dairy farmers in doing this. Okay. And down here, Jim Balls, uh, educational guy out of the University of Illinois, really made these slides look pretty for me. Uh, a clear misrepresentation of my ability to make PowerPoint slides. So if this looked good, make sure you send him a note. Okay. Very good, Corey. I think you can uh, kind of summarize and then we'll go to the Q&A. Excellent, Daryl. I appreciate your excellent presentation and uh, really bringing it home. Uh, this is a complicated topic, and that's what these webinars are all about. Our July 10th webinar, the second Monday of the month, will be Opportunities and Challenges in Dairy Replacement Heifer Raising, presented by Mike Overton, as Daryl alluded to uh, in his talk. There's a lot of synergy here back and forth. And then August 14th will be Driving Dry Matter Intake on Dairy Farms, presented by Mike Hutchins that's on this webinar from the University of Illinois. And that one is sponsored by Diamond B. And again, today's sponsor is Cargill for the presentation, Monitoring and Managing Metabolic Diseases in the Transition Cow. And with that, let's open it up for questions. Well, certainly, uh, here we go. Uh, here's our first one, and we're on the speed round. Uh, uh, how much influence, Daryl, do you think that subclinical ketosis will have on lifetime performance of a dairy herd? The question uh, I think everybody heard from Mike was on the lifetime, how much influence does subclinical ketosis have on the lifetime performance? I'm gonna guess part of that question is the longevity of the cows within the herd. And from the data we have, at least during one lactation, those cows are at higher risk for disease. And even in the absence of disease, they're at higher risk of being removed. So if you are removed, or get one of these severe metabolic diseases, that dramatically impacts the lifetime performance of the herds. I would really love to get together the money and the patients to do a two or three lactation cow study of this stuff to see the impact as it goes from one lactation to the subsequent lactation to the next one. Because as we see the impact on reproduction, we know that has an impact on their energy balance in the subsequent lactation. So I think it, without studying it rigorously, it probably has a very big impact. Here's another one just came in, and is there an on-farm NEFA test available? If you're an engineer and asking that question, let's get together and we'll try to develop it and uh, commercialize it. Uh, I'm up for that. But currently there are no on-farm or even cow, or even better, cow side NEFA tests. Currently, you've got to take that blood and handle it pretty carefully. You got to keep it cool and centrifuge off the serum from the from the cells pretty quickly and send it to a diagnostic lab. Unfortunately. I'm going to double up on two of these questions here. One has, and both of them relate to bypass fat on the commercial market. And they want to know which day would you recommend start eating, uh, uh, recommending or not recommending at all? And then if it is, would you use the 16, uh, the palmitic saturated fatty acid or the steric saturated fatty acid if you said yes or no? Is that too much in one question? That's a lot in one question. Um, and uh, I don't have a definitive answer for you on that. And uh, I'd welcome uh, any input uh, from you, Dr. Hutchins, on that question if, if you'd like to weigh in on it, because I don't have a 
yes or no answer to that. The only comment, uh, uh, Daryl, I would add is that uh, the stearic acid, uh, if, if from some sources say it has more health benefits, or the palmitic, which is the C16, has more milk fat drive on it. There's big controversy on this, though, between Michigan State and some of the other research groups as well on that. But if you lo- look back through the literature, I, I think we're going to be looking at uh, at uh, stearic acid as far as that goes. And then there's always a question, does, does that added fat with the high blood NEFAs, does that work against the cow? And there's another controversy for Daryl. I don't know. Uh, if NEFAs are high and then I add fat to the diet, does that does that help or hinder the cow? Daryl's not going to answer. Another tough question there, Doc. <laughs> okay. You're, um... so a little bit of fat feeding is probably a good energy source. Too much, you know, uh, I'll, I'll invoke Dr. Drakeley again here. Um, like the energy, we want to go Goldilocks diet there, not too much, not too little. Probably the same thing for feeding fats as well. We've got to come to some agreement on what the Goldilocks level of fat feeding is. Particularly, I don't think we're going to be able to solve a transition cow energy balance problem if it were marked by high NEFAs by simply feeding them more fat. Right? I agree with you. Very good. We'll move on. What's your opinion of using calcium propionate uh, postpartum versus the the drench for five days of propylene glycol? Uh, can we get the same point using uh, calcium propionate? For I do like uh, calcium propionate as part of my sick cow drench. You know, um, and we can go into that recipe perhaps in some other webinar or offline. Um, so I'm an advocate of calcium propionate, but we're not going to get the same amount of energy boost or that insulin surge as we're going to get with propylene glycol. So you're not going to get the same effect from calcium propionate. Very good. Here's another one. Boy, they just keep coming. It, 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 it's, it's a given that high weight loss uh, cows have a risk of ke- developing ketosis. And if so, if these cows develop severe or, or clinical ketosis, is there a carryover effect to the next lactation? To my knowledge, no one has rigorously studied that carryover effect to the next lactation. However, I'll make inference that anything bad that happens to those cows in early lactation delays them getting pregnant, which then delays or lengthens their dry period, which makes that a little bit harder to manage, which makes controlling that energy intake during the dry period even more important. So in an obtuse sort of way, I'm going to suggest there probably is a carryover effect, but I don't know if it's a direct physiologic effect, if there is a genetic component to that, or it's just a downstream management effect. Okay, uh, a couple more here, and then we'll uh, we'll turn it back to Corey to wrap up, and then we'll finish up if we have time. Uh, let's take this last one. It's a good one. Taking into account daily fluctuation and blood metabolite levels uh, before feeding, after feeding, at what time of the day do you suggest collecting blood samples to make comparisons uh, to, with these threshold values? Do you have a protocol of when we should take the samples? Yeah, that's a a great and important question. Our colleague uh, Stephen LeBlanc at uh, Ontario Veterinary College, University of Guelph, studied that pretty closely. And for herd management decisions, for internal benchmarking, the most important thing to do is within herd, simply do it at the same time of day in relation to day and feeding. Then you'll probably be okay. There is definite fluctuations, and we have to be careful of that for research purposes. But for herd management decisions, for measuring BHBAs or BHBs, same time of day is good. Probably the best bet is right around feeding. Um, And NEFAs, you probably want to get those right before feeding if you can. But for herd management, it's um, surprisingly less important than we might think. But there is definitely biological variation. 
Well, what we're going to do now is turn it back to Corey and let him kind of give the benediction. And then uh, we have a little time left. We'll pick up a few more questions here. Uh, Ron, I know some of you have to leave at 1 o'clock. Uh, Corey, do you want to do kind of the wrap-up at this point? Absolutely, Mike. And uh, again, we are just delighted to bring this webinar to you or the Hordes Dairyman team and working with Daryl Nidum on the presentation, Monitoring and Managing Metabolic Diseases in the Transition Cow. And our partners in these webinar series, award-winning webinar series, I might add, are Mike Cutchins from the University of Illinois, Jim Balt, also at the University of Illinois, and my coworker, Patty Hurchin. And I am Corey Geiger, Managing Editor of Hordes Dairyman, and our next webinar will be July 10th. Okay, well, I know we're going to lose some of you here. Uh, uh, Daryl, are you okay to take a couple more questions? Yeah, I'm okay. And uh, before everyone signs off, thank you for tuning in and thanks for uh hordes and everyone who helped me get this together it's a good time okay very good um we'll just take a couple more what about glycerin for a treatment uh but kind of a byproduct is coming off of the uh production of diesel uh any thoughts on glycerin for a treatment the short answer is uh yes and and i know that to be employed on a, on a bunch of dairy farms um I haven't seen a really good head-to-head -head comparison with, with propylene glycol, but it, it can be used, and I don't know that it's been studied as rigorously as, as glycol. And I can't imagine the cost difference is too big. You know, if we're looking at it, just a few bucks for glycol, and I know that Great. works. Very good. Uh, if you had have a separate fresh cow group, is there something to feed to effectively in the TMR to address subclinical ketosis? Uh, I think you've already mentioned uh, feeding propylene glycol, calcium propionate comes into mind. Uh, we already covered the fat feeding, I guess. Uh, any other thoughts on that? In the short term, yeah, we can try to address that. But, you know, balanced diet for those fresh cows is super important. What really matters is what we set, up, set them up to do metabolically and hormonally at the end of the previous lactation and through the dry period. But that said, you know, some feed additives that we can put in there, which uh, are biologically uh, true and you need to pencil out the economics of. Remensin, probably pencil's pretty good. Niacin, the biology's there. Um, choline, the biology's also there for that. We have another question. Um, uh, can you briefly explain why propylene glycol gives an insulin surge, or how does it do it? Um, it gives the surge in the in the bolus effect, okay? Because you give it orally, and it's picked up so quickly, as opposed to when it's fed it uh, is metabolized more slowly so you don't get that insulin surge. I hope that answers the question. That's one of the detriments of the, these webinars. I can't judge from your face whether it's making sense <laughs> I think not. it makes perfectly good sense. Here's your last question. And what do you think is the likelihood of fresh cow disease being highly heritable as a genetic factor uh, while feeding, we understand, has an impact as well? That's a great question and, and one that uh, we're actually, uh, we put together a couple of these GWAS studies, these genome-wide association studies, trying to figure out the heritability of this hyperketonemia um, because it seems like no matter what we do preventively, some cows just get it. And what we really wanted to figure out were those cows, which I will call genetic all-stars, those cows that can mobilize body tissues, whether it be fat or, or muscle, without going into a disease state and emerge from that mobilization and keep on rocking that milk production. And what our preliminary data suggests is, yeah, there is some heritable component to it, but it's like a 50-50 thing. It's not, if you have this group of genes, you're always going to be doomed to be hyperketonemic or if you, or the converse. So it's still always something we're going to have to manage. But I think going forward, we'll, we will uncover some heritability factors that maybe 
we'll be able to do some breeding stuff with. Okay, well, we had a couple of questions that related to urine pH and anionic salts, and I think we'll kind of put those off for another webinar a bit later at this point. So, Daryl, I want to thank you very much for uh, all the hard work and uh, and big challenge. You went through a lot of great research here in a very timely matter, very easy to understand. So with that, uh, Corey, do you have anything uh, in closing here? I think we're done here in uh, Champaign-Urbana. Yep, and just one one more big thank you to Cargill for host, uh, being our sponsor for this webinar. Without sponsorship, we couldn't make this all happen. So again, thank you to Cargill. And have a great rest of your week.